And welcome to another edition of the Odyssey House Journals. I'm Trip Mitchell, joined as always now for our 33rd show, Randall Carlisle. Is that how many we've done? That is pretty impressive. So at a, for a talent fee of a thousand bucks a show, uh, that's, that's a lot of money. <laughs> that is. Yes, and as if we fact, were getting it. <laughs> this is a show about addiction, but more importantly, it's a show about recovery. And one of the reasons that we're so excited to be doing this show is we have our first return guest, and I'm wow. so excited about this because we haven't ever done a follow-up. We, you meet people on this podcast, and then they sort of go off and do whatever they do. And we got to bring somebody back who was on our first podcast. Fantastic. Right. And uh, so what we're going to do, just if this is your first time watching the show, we're all about recovery and the resources, the hundreds and thousands of people in the community of Utah who want to help. So during the course of the show, we're going to put a number up on the screen, which is Odyssey House. And Randall, as you know, a longtime newsman around the country, but retired from the news. You could have gone on for many more years. Yeah, I still had two years left on my contract. But wanted to do something to make a yeah, difference. I got a job offer at Odyssey, and I thought, I'm in recovery. What a perfect place to end my working career. So I'm at Odyssey, and I'm happy to be here. Sure. Yeah. And I'm in recovery as well, and Lee, our producer, cameraman, and director is also in recovery. And this is a way that we do this show to give back and to let people know there is hope. So at the bottom of the screen, if you're watching the TV show, you'll see a number for Odyssey House. And uh, if you're listening on iTunes or some of the other podcast platforms, the number to call is... You don't remember it, do you? I, did, I, I see. I just wanted to test him. 801-322-3222. 801-322-3222. And if you call that number, there's some wonderful people there to help. And we're not saying that there's any one way to get sober. There are many, many different ways. Randall and I use AA as, as our base in the 12-step program. But there are a lot of people out there to help. And once you make that call, life gets a lot easier. So with that in mind, let's introduce our, our star. Guest. I mean, yeah. when we last join Beverly Martinez. I'm trying to think. If I was doing a setup for a news story or something, she was looking at 10 years in a federal prison after being busted for delivering meth. And she's still here. I'm still here. So, okay, from the point that you were here the first time, you were looking at a federal trial for, I don't know what the charges were, but it had to do with delivering meth, right? Yes, to an uh, undercover. And so you're not in prison. No. What in the heck happened between then and now? Let's see, I became a Voyager in the Odyssey House and um, a wonderful woman named Becky heard me speaking and thought, you know what, this woman is doing great things with her life and we're gonna sign her up for the UAC program, which only 16 people ever get accepted. And what's the name of that program again? It's called the UAC program and only 16 people ever get accepted and it's you have to go in front of a big panel and you have to speak your heart out and let them know why you do not deserve to go to prison. And I got accepted. So it took off my 10 year prison sentence. And um, I'm in a two year program now, which is way better than sitting in a prison cell. You think? And it was all due to Odyssey. And That's, Becky does work for Odyssey as well. The thing, the thing we should point out, and this is what amazed me when I first met you, is you were, you, you were looking at a, at a trial and, and a 10 year federal prison term, and you still went into Odyssey House. Yes. And it, maybe for people who didn't watch that episode, why in the world would you, you could just say, hey, I'm gonna stay high and wait for the trial and then I'll go into prison and I'll be sober for 10 years in prison. Why, yes. Why'd you decide to do that? When I went to jail and was facing, for, actually 40 years <laughs> at that time, when I, was in, when I was sitting in the jail cell, and I decided to change my life. My kids didn't deserve to have their mother the way that I was, even if I was sitting in a jail cell, even if I was in a prison. And then I went to Odyssey House and I started to learn about myself and learn that um, I deserve better, even if it was in prison. I deserve to live happy, even if it was 10 years in prison. And I was gonna change my life. So sobriety, really, if you talk, I mean, Odyssey, yes, the, the program you got into, but it all starts with sobriety, right? Yes. And and. I, I, we should we should tell the story because uh, for people who didn't watch the first one, back in the day you were doing what on a motorcycle? <laughs> I mean, just 
I used to ride my Harley in the middle of winter in a miniskirt with my boots on, a bandana over my face, with a fifth of whiskey, always. I never rode my bike with, it was like, they were connected, my whiskey and my bike. And, and the Slurpee would, straw. And the Slurpee straw, yes, all over town. I'd go from bar to bar to bar. You know, I'm, I've never seen a motorcyclist in a miniskirt during the winter. Yes. I, with a bottle of booze in her bra, slurping. And drinking it as I'm riding. <laughs> I, you know, you'd think that would draw some police attention on you the way. You would think. And I, I've been sitting wondering about this. Like, how did I not ever get pulled over? So God's actually... Never were pulled over. Never once was I ever pulled over. <laughs> ever. That is truly yes. amazing. Do you have frostbite of the knee and the shin? No, but I used to have the sunburn... There was like no other. My my legs would be red from here to here. My arms, because I just wear my vest, and my forehead, because I wouldn't cover it up. <laughs> well, you've, I mean, in a, in a way, you led a blessed life there, although you got in trouble for other things. Yes. And now your life is really blessed. I mean, tell us about your life now. Let's see. I've um, graduated a courage to change class one, courage to change two. I've terminated county probation. I have graduated Odyssey House, which is a big blessing. I was there to see you and applying yes, for you yes, when you did that. Yes, thank you. How long were you yes. in? I was in the house seven months, and I was a voyager for three and a half months. So almost a year of your life. Yes. Every day doing Every day. concrete. And that's something that when people think about, you hear about rehab, and a lot of times your favorite star will go into rehab, and they talk about 30 days, and that is going to change your life. And that really is a misconception that a oh, lot yes. of people have. Well, so when I went into Odyssey, I had this big plan. I got there August 23rd, 2018, and I did this little this little calendar. Okay, I'm going to be graduated from the program by November 5th. <laughs> I was wow. going to be out of there, you know, two weeks in each each level, and that's not the case. It takes a lot more after 36 years of using, it takes a lot longer to get yourself into the place where I am now. And and you know, that's a point I have a problem, and I'll, I'll just be honest about it, with these for-profit treatment centers that do the TV ad saying in 30 days we'll fix your life. And I, like for me, I was a functional alcoholic for over 40 years. You said what, 36, 36 years? You can't go into any kind of program unless maybe they dissect your, take parts of your brain out or something. You can't go into a program and in 28 days change what you've been doing for 36 or 40 years. How long did you drink? Um, 30 years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you, you can't do that. I, I challenge anybody to, to and if we have a for-profit watching, I'd love you to, for you to prove to me that your program works in 30 days because I just don't think it can be done. I don't think it's possible. No. And in, in my case, I chose, I did it on my own, but I had a lot of family help and people there to design. And, and there, there's no right or wrong way to kick an addiction. No, and but you need to figure out what's right for yourself. But and, I agree. And you I'm, still go to AA meetings. Sure I do. still go to AA meetings. I've been clean for seven years. Yeah. And I never want to forget what it is I, I need to remember not to do. You and know. doing this show is wonderful. Just speaking for myself, yeah. it's wonderful to get to meet people like Beverly and to see what's possible. And also to talk to people whose stories have been much rougher. And people have come back from horrible places in their lives and have come back to live wonderful lives, be great parents, be great sons and daughters, and parts of the community. And that's the, the reason for the show. Sure. Recovery is possible for anyone. I, I remember talking to you. I, I, I believe that almost everybody involved in some kind of addictive behavior suffered some kind of trauma in their life. And I, I, if you don't mind sharing when you were a young girl, the trauma that you went through. I went through a lot of trauma. I was molested for many, many, many years by several family members. I was beaten. Uh, my best friend, we were raped in the mountains. Um, she died. I survived. And that took a long time for me to accept. You know, why did I live? Why, why didn't I just die with her? And I had to carry that around. Um, I left home at a young age, I think I was 13, went on the streets, I was just from house to house, we got pregnant at a young age, and just, I drank my life away. From the drinking, I went to the meth, got more meth, more meth, more drinking, and just continued from there to where I was at rock bottom a year and a half ago, I was at rock bottom. I'd lost a 15-year um, relationship, he left me for another girl, 
that was traumatizing. Um, I lost my home. I lost everything in my life. And all I did was get up in the morning, drink, and when I did sleep, you know, that was, that was on occasion. But you would never recognize me today. I mean, if you would see the pictures. I believe yeah. it. I, I mean, you might have been, you might have seemed like fun back then, but I, but I like you. I think I like you a lot better. Yeah, than, it got to the point where I wasn't even fun anymore. Really? Where I was just, nobody answered the phone for me anymore. My kids didn't even want to answer the phone for me. That's Beverly. Put it down. Yeah, and, and that's how it was. You know, because I was either asking for alcohol or some kind of excuse to get money for drugs. Right. Because, I mean, before, before everything fell apart, I mean, I was able to go out and hustle and, and do what I had to do, no matter, regardless of what it was, to get my drugs. So I always had them. And it got to the point where I couldn't even do that anymore. I would just lay in a ball. Jeez. I was cutting <laughs> myself up. I have many, many scars. Hmm. I slit my own throat. And I was just begging God to take me away. You I just slit wanted to your die. throat? I slit my throat. I've slit my arms. I mean, many, she many times. She does have some scars here. Oh, I have tons yeah. of scars. I'm scarred all over. Yeah, I have them all over my legs. I would just stab myself because I just didn't want to live anymore. There was no reason for me to live. And for some reason, God said, hey, if we do not put you in a jail cell for some amount of time, and thank God for Judge Pede because he kept me there. He knew something about me needed to stay in jail. We just talked about this Monday. My daughter went with me. And he says, I remember you. I remember when I kept your mom in jail. How did you feel? And she goes, that was the best thing you could have ever done. How old is your daughter now, by the way? She's 28. Um, and she's like, that's the best thing that could have ever happened to her, was you kept her in jail. And even though I cried because we didn't want to see our mom like that, yeah, it saved her life. And I thank him every, every time I see him, I thank him for doing that for me. And facing all the prison time was a blessing. You, because I would, I, just like I told the judge, I would have gotten out. If you would have let me out on pretrial, I would have gotten out and I would have been in the same predicament that I was before. There would have been no way I would have ever thought, I'm going to do this. You know, even though I made that decision in jail, I know, I know for a fact now, after all the treatment I've gone through, and with Justin Hughes telling me I was a con artist, I knew I would have lagged my way through everything. It's, it been. it's really interesting. Randall touched upon this earlier, but I was so impressed with someone looking at a long federal prison stint, wanting to get take care of themselves prior. And one of the things I've learned throughout all these shows is that, and you hit on it, people have problems that may lead to drinking. And to take care of, irrespective of whether you stop drinking or doing drugs, take care of that problem, that core problem. And talking to people and wonderful counselors really helps along the way. Oh, yes. And the added bonus in your case is that you're clean and sober. Yes, and 436 days today. Not that you're counting. Not that I'm counting at all. But taking care and talking through some trauma that you might have had at a young time, something that, that causes that angst. Yes. So there's so many benefits to getting clean and sober. Oh, yes. How long did it take in counseling to kind of figure out what the things in your past were that are causing challenges? I think the biggest thing that hit me was when Justin told me I was a con artist and how I have just lied my way through everything. Like the pain, the sorrow, everything that I've gone through, I just would lie, oh, it's okay, you know, it, that, that, was, that was okay. Yeah, that happened, but you know, it, that it happened, really happened. Yeah, and I just went on, you know, and then it led me back to where I was again. And it took me probably from, from the day I went to jail until I really decided, hey, this is what I really want, probably about four months. It took about four months. Was it an aha moment? It was just like, some light shined on me and it's like hey Bev you know what you deserve better you, you know you need to live your life's purpose there's a reason why you're still here and and listening to other people was a big part of my recovery and that's why I like giving back so much because I always remember where I came from by hearing their stories by by hearing where, where they're at you know and I still go and I attend groups and stuff like that to to just listen and that's what that was a big thing for me is listening because I can talk my way through anything. <laughs> and, and you have all and, your life. Yeah, yeah, my whole entire life. I was a con artist. I yeah. faked my way through life. I mean, look, I be, I'm going to be 50 years old and barely catching a case now after all the ruckus I've caused and all the streets, I, you know, all the things I've done on the streets, all the people I've hurt. You know, I could have killed somebody, but I didn't go to jail. And what I admire about you now is the fact that you are such a shining example to other people 
who are thinking of being in recovery or thinking of getting sober or people already in recovery. Because if, if you can do it with the past you described, anybody can, right? Yes. And how, and how does that make you feel uh, being, come on in. <laughs> this is a, this is a, uh, we, that's one of the cool things about shooting a podcast. Have a seat. Our and, next guest came our, and a TV show. Is we're very seat. relaxed here, yeah. and uh, <laughs> yeah. it's a nice way to come in. I have a seat right next, right there. You're perfect. One of the one of the things that's really important, at least in my recovery, I never really liked myself very well, yeah. and I can t- and I think that's true of a lot of people because there's a lot of shame involved with addiction and things like that. And you seem to, I don't know if you liked yourself back in the day, I but didn't. but you seem to really love yourself now, and that's I so do. important. How do you I, feel about being sober and yourself? How do I feel about being sober? It's and, the most amazing feeling that I could have ever imagined. And yourself, I mean, do you... By myself, I love myself. Every day I can wake up and I actually love myself. I love who I am, I love where I'm at, I love where I've been, because I've made my struggle into my gift. I have turned that struggle that I have lived my whole life into what my gift is, and I will become a legend in recovery. You, you already are at Odyssey <laughs> yeah. House, but in, well, in, that, that confidence is addictive. And Randall, you have done an amazing job booking guests because nine out of nine and a half times, the person that sits in this chair and tells their story are kind of have a charisma and enthusiasm and a joie de vivre, a love of life. Yes. That jumps out. Well, and, and that's the whole point of, of, of this podcast. Is I, it, sorry for throwing a French word well, in there. Yeah. <laughs> what was that again? Okay. I don't understand. That was French onion soup. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, the, uh, it's, it's so, it, the reason we do this podcast is so that people uh, who maybe have loved ones or themselves or think they may have a problem or, or maybe are thinking of recovery or something like that, it's, it's so great to have somebody like Beverly on saying, you can do it, you know, yes. but, but you have to admit you have a problem and you want help. Otherwise, that's, that's no, for sure. no place is going to work. For sure. Right? And, you know, and the other thing, too, is, is you've got to, most importantly, realize you have a problem and want help. But, and then there's another step in, in willing to do whatever it takes. Yes. The and work. Yep, because it is work. You probably have sat through more meetings and heard more stories. <laughs> yes. My, I was in a meeting one time, and the, sometimes... AA meetings, in our case, can be some of the funnest hours you'll ever spend. Or some of the most boring. The longest hour of your life? Yes. You, the old thing where you look at the watch and you think it's been 20 minutes and it's been yeah, 40 seconds. Yeah. 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 But we got on the subject of fishing one time and then every share was about camping and how great it was. And it really, these people had wonderful stories and it was just laughter. And then finally a guy was asked to share and he was homeless and he goes, if you're being homeless for a couple of years, the ideas of camping outdoors and fishing don't appeal to me yeah, at all. For sure. And a big <laughs> laugh. But in one, one sentence, one share, he encapsulated what it's like to be homeless. And there are a lot of people yeah. who addiction sends them on the street. It can be the most devastating thing for people. Yes. So you've probably seen a lot of that. I've, I've seen a lot of it. I've never been homeless. I've lived in places I don't want to be that were just I don't were remember horrible. us living together. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well yeah. God, I don't remember half my life, yeah. so yeah. we never know. Same here. So, yeah. yeah. Maybe we met we, at we an earlier time. We probably partied time, at so. a bar one night. Yeah. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Let me buy you a drink, yeah. Bev. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you a ride on my Harley yeah. home. <laughs> In the middle of a snowstorm. Yeah. yeah. There was no Uber yeah. there with an there extra no sippy straw yeah. in, in, in the bottle. Yeah, yeah, give you a little straw in the yeah. back. Yeah. <laughs> Have you met a lot of people in recovery who were homeless? And I have a niece that's homeless right now. She lives at the library. Oh, you're And, sure. yes, and we've, we were trying to get her. She's actually went to Odyssey. We got her into the Mill Creek program, and she's ran. And I just really feel that she's just not ready. And sometimes you can't, you can't ever force anybody to want to get help. We just we let her know that we're there for her, and there's resources for her, and we'll do whatever it takes. We'll pick her up at any given hour if that's what it takes. But she is homeless, and and I thank God that I never was. I mean, sometimes in some of the places I've lived, I probably would have been better off <laughs> being homeless, you know. But that was part of my struggle. It's what I was choosing. And your niece, when you talk to her. What are some of the things you say, and, and is it... I just tell her that I love her. I love her, and, and we're here for her whenever she's ready. 
because she knows that she's got a family. We have a great family support. I mean, a support, a family that I never even realized was such support. Um, and she knows that. She knows we're all here for her. And I just keep telling her I love her. And if I can do it, <laughs> you know, she can do it too. And she always tells me, Auntie, I'm so proud of you. I, I can't believe that you, you're where you're at today. So I'm hoping that I'll be her inspiration, knowing where I came from and knowing where I am now, that she will make that change. She'll want to make that change. And there's some people who don't it. want to. Yeah. I mean, it's like we got a... I, <laughs> I, the other day, we, we sometimes run stories on our Facebook page or, or, or a small little ad or something. And one of the responses we got back the other day was, I'm going to slam dope forever. Sobriety is for chumps. And right. I, I mean, now that person obviously isn't ready for a treatment yeah, program. For sure. but, <laughs> for yeah, for sure. You know, but, or maybe it was just somebody messing around. around with us. I don't know. But there are a lot of people who have that attitude. Yes, they you do. Know. And, and Beverly, in, in my case, having been in the program for 15 years, but going back out, which is our, our terminology for drinking again, is that you never know when the next time you stop might be your last time, and I hope that is in my case. Yeah. And there's another, regardless of how little time you have, it's better than it was before. Yes, for sure. So you're coming up, you're in year number two. Yes. Now, in the future, are you going to... How are you going to give back? Because I know not having taught, I know that's going to be part of what you want to do. Yes, that is It's my, my goal. Um, I'm starting classes at the university to become a CPSS worker, which is a certified peer support specialist. I will be working for Odyssey. Yeah. We will hire you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You have to wait. After graduation, you have to wait six months in order to go and be employed. But that's my focus. I, I will be up there. I will be on a panel. Where, and I'll always give back. Right now I'm doing a capstone project for the UAC program, which I will be doing the needle exchange, going out and cleaning up the surrounding areas of the Pioneer Park. Um, I'm speaking at VOAs, I'll be speaking there. And I wanna go work with the adolescents as well. So I will continue to give back because that's what's gonna keep me sober. And I know that. And, and if you think about it, I mean, Programs like Odyssey are based on, they're called therapeutic communities. And, and, and the point of them is to have somebody on a higher level in the house when, when a newcomer comes in <laughs> and have somebody like a Bev there <laughs> to do. If we could yeah. clone you, I mean, we <laughs> hire a hundred of yeah. you. Uh, but, but it makes such a difference in people's lives because if I was a, if I was a clean cut one, well, clean cut looking I guess but <laughs> yeah. if I was a clean cut looking guy with a PhD or something and you came in and in, in in new you know sobriety and and I started telling you about the dangers or the ills of of what you've been doing and the way you've been leading your life it's not going to mean anything to you no, but if you not. have somebody like a Bev talking to a new person in in recovery it makes all the difference in the world that street credibility is so important oh yes to, and, to hear the struggles of somebody that somebody that's had, you know, the struggles they've had to where they're at now. But the cool does. thing about Odyssey House, and again, we are not, this show is lucky enough that Randall and I ran into each other across the street at an AA, AA office. central office. Yeah. He said we wanted to do something. As, <laughs> it was a great date. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and Odyssey House is one of many, many wonderful facilities that can help you out. But it's a great first call to make. But one of the, the really neat things about Odyssey House is how they'll take someone like yourselves with a ton of street smartness, but then combine it with some great educational opportunities that we have here, the U of yes. U. And so people are, are taking the street smart, adding the best of academia, and coming up with someone who got powerful. a lot of answers. No powerful. one has all the answers. Yeah, for sure, but it's powerful. It is definitely powerful to, no to combine those two. And in recovery is a powerful thing. And we've run into some amazing people. And uh, one of the great, there's an expression in AA, you've got to give it away to be able to keep it. And I think that's so true. And the people that I've met who are really successful in their recovery are always trying to give it up, the next person. Yes, and that was a big thing for me in Odyssey is because when I went there, my therapist, or, you know, everybody that works in there is all from the streets. They all have past. They, they all, they can call you on your crap. And so, 
Yeah, that was a big thing for me. Did you ever get called on any of your crap? Oh boy, did I? No, I've, I've, <laughs> did I? <laughs> you had some crap I've got to some be called on because you I've have had, a charming yeah. personality, and I can see you faking people out through a lot of life. You, you can't know? do that in Odyssey. No. And so that's what made me successful. Is that I really got called on on my crap, and I got really told what was wrong with me by somebody that knows what you know. They've been there. Right. So just like you said, if I would have had somebody that was book smart and, and just right. went to college and has never been on the streets, no, I, I would have never... I think you should clean oh, up no. your act a little. I'd been like, yes, know. sir. Yeah, Okay, exactly. yeah. Let me do my assignment and I'll carry on. I'll go on my way. But see, in Odyssey, you do your assignments and you have a bunch of addicts in a room that are giving you feedback on your assignment. And they, they, all of them have been there. So you can't, you know... If you write something nice that you think people want to hear... That's know. what I got told I was a con artist. Because I write very well. I mean, I wrote in jail. I wrote my whole life. And I sat and wrote in a notebook. I could write anything. You've got a good line of BS. Yeah, yeah. for <laughs> sure. For but, sure. But now it's honest BS. Yeah, and when right. I got called a con artist, I'm like, whoa, I have been lying my whole entire life wow. for everything. Everything in my life has been a lie. And so that's when I really broke down and I really had to really think about what I was writing and the assignments that I was doing because people were really seeing through that. And that's when it, it really changed my life. Well, this has been a... Beverly, it is so <laughs> great to see you again. Good to see you, too. Because when... I was just so impressed with your story the first time we met. You really were going to do all the work, even though you were going to sit and waste that work for 10 years. But after hearing you tell the story and fixing yourself is the most important thing. And when you fix yourself, a lot of good things happen. Yeah, it just falls into place. Yeah, Everything I, falls into place. Will you come back in another 30 shows? We I will. Love to have I will be here for every 30th, every yeah, time, for go. the rest of my life. We're so, <laughs> and we're so glad you're not in federal prison now, yes. because what a waste of your life that would have been. Yes, for yeah. sure. Because yeah. I, would, I would have been going to prison May 6th, I would have gone. Really? Wow. I would have been shipped off to, yeah. And that, and you're here and doing great things. Randall, why don't you throw the number out again? So we're on iTunes. What other platforms? iTunes and Spotify. iTunes. If and you Spotify. want to listen to the podcast, uh, to the podcast, and I, <laughs> Spotify, <laughs> the podcast, and you can go on YouTube and see it. YouTube and and our Odyssey's Facebook page has the links to all those things. Fantastic. Okay, so. Or Comcast Channel 17. Thanks to yes. Bill Francis. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. And the number to call is you still don't remember it. No, but I know it, it starts with three numbers. 801-322-3222. Two, 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 two. It's not really that difficult, <laughs> except at your age with the, you know, the brain cells yeah. you've killed over the years. Yeah. Maybe. They, uh, my brain cells have a white flag up. They just finally <laughs> said Oh, mine do too. Yeah. yeah. But we have really enjoyed visiting with yeah. you again, Beverly. Thank you so much. And again, if you've got a loved one, anyone you know with a challenge, the second you pick up that phone and call and talk to some people who really want to help, you're, a lot of weight is taken off your shoulders. Sure. And when the time is right, anyone can recover. It's going to take a lot of work, but people can do it. For Randall, I'm Trip Mitchell saying thanks so much, and we'll see you next time right here. Bye-bye.